Welcome to Glad One Free Methodist Church. Here's Pastor Phil Hordup with week three of his message, Faith, Famine, Provision. Um, today is International Day of, of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And I uh, was thinking a lot about the importance of church and the importance of being part of a body of Christ and, and how we see that being part of that body of Christ has influence on all of us. One of the things that um, we're able to be part of uh, here today is Clayton Dennings turns 100 years old today. And, uh, and they're, they're having a party and a reception for him in the gym from 2 to 5 today. You're invited to be part of that. But thinking about that and, and thinking about how different people have responded to that, I've heard again and again how people are thankful how Clayton has invested in, in being a good example of what it means to follow Christ. And today we, we are mindful that the church, there are body believers gathered um, all around the world that face persecution on a high level. And this morning, we, on the first Sunday of November, we, we often call us to be mindful to, uh, to be praying for the church around the world and to be not only aware that persecution exists, but to allow be, praying for the church around the world to become part of what we do as believers. And it's something I... I've tried to uh, make part of my life for many years now. Um, right now, this past year, the number one violator, the number one persecutor of Christians has been North Korea. And we have a video I want to show you um, that tells a story about that. Just want to uh, remind you that we have, uh, there's a resource table in the fellowship hall out here with. Um, Information on there, on the table, with how you can be involved in praying for the church around the world, the persecuted church around the world. There are um, a couple things. There's, uh, there's armbands to remind you to pray with, uh, with the website for Voice of the Martyrs, where you can go and get more information on how you can help be involved. There's opportunities even to, even to write or send emails in, in, in many instances. Also on the table, there's information about the missionaries that we support at the church, I encourage you to grab that. Many of the missionaries we partner with are in, are in countries that are identified as at risk, and some serve in countries that are considered high risk. And um, it's important that we're mindful of, of how, uh, how real uh, persecution is and how often it happens. And each year, um, for the last several years, I've brought to you information from the um, the world watch list that Open Doors puts out every year. And I was um, reminded, and I was going through this and, and reading some things that they've identified um, as continuing to happen. And one thing that's continuing to happen is persecution continues to increase. Um, and it has had a 14% increase since last year, and which, which computes to this last year, 215 million um, People experienced high levels of persecution. In 2019, 245 million experienced high levels of persecution. Worldwide, one in nine Christians will experience high levels of persecution. And just to kind of give us a picture of, of what this looks like, 4,136 Christians were killed for faith-related reasons this last year. That's, a, a, that's 11 Christians killed every day for their faith. So we, we need to be mindful that persecution is a very real thing. And it's all, persecution is something that's, that has always been around since people have proclaimed the name of God. Because the enemy is, seeks to destroy that which glorifies God. See, we live in a world that is broken. We live in a world in which, um, in which people coming to Christ makes, makes the enemy angry. But in the midst of all this, we need to be mindful God is still working. Did you, I don't know if you could see all the way in the back, uh, but the, Pastor Han had discipled over a thousand Christians in North Korea who are now discipling other Christians. You see, God's church, his work continues to go forth and continues to grow. 
When I think about um, and read about what happens, what's happening in, in the church around the world, I'm reminded that um, learning from accounts like Pastor Hans have had a tremendous impact upon my life and my walk. See, as a young person, um, one of the things that, um, that I believe God used to, to, uh, to work on my heart and to, and to move in a way where I would respond to his call to enter ministry was the stories of those who have faced persecution and how they stood up against it. See, when I was... Um, we grew, I don't know if you guys remember this, but remember in the 70s they had these Christian Spire comic books where, you, anyone old, I mean, I don't know if anyone remembers this or not, but anyway, they had these comic books that came out in the bookstore. I used to go to bookstores then instead of going to Amazon.com. And they had these comic books there that told stories, and they were summaries of, of uh, biographies and novels by and large. And there was a comic book out that told the story of Brother Andrew. And uh, I read that, cover to cover, over and over, about this, uh, about this man who wanted to get the word of God into closed communist countries. And God opened up doors for him to, to, to get in and to distribute God's word again and again and again. And this, this man spent his whole life um, serving God and taking God's word into places that were considered high-risk countries. And, and because of him, the ministry Open Doors started, which re brings out the world watch list every year. And I read different ones. In, in high school, I read a true account of a, of a soldier in the Soviet Union who was a Christ follower. And, and it told his story, his true story, of, as people learned he followed Christ and has, has those in authority over him learned how they persecuted him over time until he eventually lost his life. And those things um, did something to my heart. The Lord used those things to move in my heart about the urgency of sharing Christ today, about understanding that there's, there's more to, to life than just what we experience this moment, but our life is about bringing glory to God. And in God's word, we find example after example of men and women who, who trusted God with, with everything and their greatest desire became to glorify God. You see, the, the fundamental core truth of our faith is that Jesus changes hearts and lives. That he came so others might know who Jesus is. And I believe God is, is waking us up to that truth and that reality. God is doing something, and he's calling us, church, to respond. Last few days, I've, I've, I've seen some news stories come across about, about a person whom I never paid much attention to, Kanye West, who who's been showed up on late night talk shows, which I never watched, but I've seen clips of him on these late night talk shows that never glorify God, and he's talking about his new project called Jesus is King. And he shares a story of what God's doing in his life. Then I find a video clip in September. He was in, he was in Detroit and was sharing, and he had his pastor share a message and the pastor's message was all about God's holiness and the reality of our sin in our life and people's need to come to Christ and repent of their sins. And people are debating, is he really saved or not? And I'm thinking, I just know God's doing something. God's doing something when, when Jimmy Kimmel says the words, Jesus is king on his late night show. God is doing something. God's doing something when, when we hear uh, and we see people gathered who would never go to, to any kind of other function about Christ, but because it's Kanye West, they'll go and, they'll, and they're hearing the gospel and it's not a compromised gospel. And I'm thinking, God, you're doing something. And I'm not going to pretend that I know the man because I don't, but I know 
God is doing something when his name is being proclaimed with truth and power of who he is. That God is a holy God. That God is a God who changes hearts and lives. And I think about this. If God could save me with my bent on sinning and with what I was insistent on having in my life, if he can save me and deliver me from that, then I have to believe and know he can deliver. He can deliver Kanye and others like him. If I don't believe that, I have nothing. The Bible gives us again and again examples of of the fact that there is a spiritual battle, there is warfare that happens. Satan hates God's name being proclaimed. And we live in a fallen, broken world, and Satan seeks to kill and destroy and deceive people in the following false gods. That's what we've been seeing happening as we've been looking at Elijah in 1 Kings 17 and 18. Elijah's name literally means, my God is the Lord. Isn't that cool? People would, would see Elijah and they'd say Elijah, and that would mean, it'd be the same as us saying, my God, my God is the Lord. I was thinking about that this morning. I, wouldn't it be great if people saw us when we went into our place of work and whatever our name is, they'd say, oh, there's Jim. He follows the Lord. Whatever your name is, put your name there. And the first thing they would think is they follow the Lord. Church, I want our witness to grow and become more and more like that. I want people to think that we're a little strange, that we're a little different because we follow Jesus. I joke sometimes the Bible says that we're to be a peculiar people. I joke sometimes that I'm overachieving in that area. But man, I want people to see, I want people to know that there is a passion within us that's different because it's about God. So in 1 Kings, we're, inter- we're introduced to Elijah. And it's important for us to, to not miss the truth that, that Elijah's ministry and the message he brought was during a time of physical famine. They were in a, a physical famine and a serious drought in the entire region, but it was also a spiritual famine. The leadership had completely forsaken God. Ahab was known as being an evil king, and his wife was known as being uh, even worse, if that is possible. And her whole ambition in life was to introduce the, the, the idol worship of Baal into the land. And, and, and Baal worship sought to deceive the people. The people believed wholeheartedly that if, if we had good crops and fertile soil and things were happening, it was because Baal has blessed us. And Baal was an evil form of worship which only took from the people. Jezebel was working to eradicate Israel of anyone who would proclaim the name of the Lord and was, and was systematically executing prophets of God. But God was raising up people who loved and feared the Lord. Remember Elijah met a woman in Zarephath, a widow. And miraculous things happened and the widow feared the Lord and she obeyed the Lord and God moved in a miraculous way. Another man was an attendant to Ahab, a king, Ahab the king. His name was Obadiah, and he was faithfully hiding these prophets in safe places and feeding them and caring for their needs so they would, so they would make it through this time of execution. He had had 150 in two different places. God was moving, and God was going to make himself known. So in 1 Kings uh, chapter 18, verse 1, just to give you some background, um, <clears throat> I want to go read a few verses there. Verse 1 of chapter 18. After a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria, and Ahab summoned Obadiah, who was in charge of his palace. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. When Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, fifty in each. 
and had supplied them with food and water. Ahab had said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find some grass and keep the horses and mules alive so we will not have to kill any of the animals. So they divided the land they were to cover. Ahab going in one direction and Obadiah in another. As Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. Obadiah recognized him, bowed down to the ground and said, Is it really you, my lord Elijah? Yes, he replied, Go tell your master, Elijah is here. What have I done, asked Obadiah, that you are handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death? As surely as the Lord your God lives, there is not a nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to look for you. And wherever a nation or kingdom claimed you were not there, he made them swear they could not find you. But now you tell me, go to my master and say, Elijah is here. I don't know where the Spirit of the Lord may carry you when I leave. If I go and tell Ahab and he doesn't find you, he will kill me. Obadiah is saying to Elijah, he's saying, look, Ahab's been hunting for you. And I know you're a man of God and God's going to keep his hand on you. He's going to protect you so when he can't find you, then I'm done. But I said, I've been faithful. I worship the Lord. Verse 13, haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did? While Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord, I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in two caves, 50 in each, and supplied them with food and water. And now you tell me, go to my master and say, Elijah is here. Elijah said, he will kill me. Elijah said, as the Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. I want to pause for, uh, for just a moment and, and, and be mindful of, of where the, the level of fear that's going on. When we think about the church, and we think about this being the day of prayer for the persecuted churches, we pray for them, we should pray that God would release them and release us from fear that we would know God is on the throne and he is over all and he is able. Continues in verse 16, it says, So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all of Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, Am I the only one, or I am the only one that the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls and let, us, let them choose one for themselves. Let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but do not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of the Lord your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. O Baal, answer us, they shouted but there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he is deep in thought, or busy, or traveling. Some translations say he asked the question, perhaps he's relieving himself. Maybe he's asleep. Maybe he must be awakened. So they shouted louder. 
and they slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response, no one answered, and no one paid attention. The ugliness of the idolatry was being exposed. Turning away from God will cost you everything. Paul talks about how when we're given over to sin, the foolish things seem wise and seem to make sense. And here are these 450 prophets of Baal are dancing around and trying to get the attention of their God, who clearly isn't going to respond. He's a fake God. And they're slashing themselves. They're mutilating themselves. It's a terrible scene. Then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. This is verse 30. They came to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord which was in ruins. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seas of seed, which means there are deep trenches that each trench would hold close to five gallons of water, if not more. He said, your name shall be Israel. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. Dug a trench around it. Verse 33, he arranged the wood, cut the bowl into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, fill the four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said. And they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered. And they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God, that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil and also licked up the water in the trenches. When the people saw this, they fell down prostrate and cried out, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. A couple weeks ago, I asked you the question, when have you been aware of God's presence? Or when was the last time you knew you were experiencing a God, a God moment? I also asked, when, when have you experienced a real time of Christian growth in your walk? Here's what I know, church. Being aware of God's presence, experiencing growth in our walk, needs to be a normal part of the Christian experience. And the truth is, a lot of times we are not experiencing those things because the altar of our heart is in ruin. First thing Elijah did was he rebuilt the altar to the Lord. It had been neglected. It had been in ruins. People weren't paying attention to what God wanted. God didn't have the seed of priority in their life. And he asked the question. Elijah says, how long will you waver? I was looking at the word that, that comes translated out often as waver. In Hebrew, it would be, how long will you dance between the choices of these gods? How long will you try, how long will you seek to believe that you can entertain Baal and entertain the living God? You can't do it. So Elijah said, you, 
How long will you do this dance between the two? Choose who you follow. The gospel message clearly presents that there is a choice. There's a decision. There's one God, and He's a holy God. He loves us with everything, but He's a holy God. And He wants us to surrender to Him. So here they are in this famine, three years of drought. They rebuild the altar. Eli just reminded him, God's made this covenant with you and God loves you and he's, he's established his covenant and you've turned your back on him. Look, this is in shambles. We need to rebuild this and we need to acknowledge our need for God who is the living God, who is God alone. Then he says it's built and they had their sacrifice. He says, soak it with water. They were in famine. I'm not sure it was all that easy for them to get water, not once, but three times. But Elijah says, there will be no doubt that this is from the Lord. There will be no doubt that God is providing. There will be no doubt that, that when our faith is in, in God and God alone, that when our faith is in God, even in, even in famine, even when all seems to be lost, when we, when we say, God, it's all yours, that God will provide us with what we need. So they soak it down. I want to ask you, church, to look at the altar of your heart. Consider the condition of it. Do you need some time with God? Are there things that need to be repented and turned away from? Are there things that we need to surrender to God? There are things that we have to surrender to God. Sometimes they're not necessarily sinful things. They're things that are deep concerns for us. I, uh, when, I, when I was a young father, I'm still a young father. When I was a younger father, I came to understand as my children grew that they really weren't mine. They were entrusted to me by the Lord to build into them and to love them and to surrender them to the Lord. And I had to be reminded of that at times because there are, um, because we're human, right? We struggle with that. These days I'm being reminded that, you know, as we, as our family walks through this journey with my bride, I get this, so I have these moments so where I get upset like with like insurance companies because things take time or whatever it is. And I'm reading God's word and I'm thinking about this passage and I'm thinking about Elijah finding all this water when it was in the middle of a drought and I find that God says to me, just give me what you don't understand. And trust me and see what I'll do. Because I'm the living God. And I will glorify my name. Will you trust God with what you don't understand? And it's not an easy thing. It's not a one time and done thing. Sometimes you have to redo it several times in one day. But man, God showed up. 
Fire came from heaven. It burned up everything. <laughs> By the way, rain's coming. We'll talk about that next week. And the people could do nothing. But they came undone. And they saw the power of God and they fell down. And they just said, you are the Lord God. You are God. You are over all things. Father, fall on us. Fall on us, Lord, with your presence. Church, we don't know what it is to be undone. But God is real. And he is on his throne. And he is drawing people onto himself. And the church is growing. And people are hungry to know who Jesus is. And if you're hearing this message and you don't know who Jesus is, maybe, maybe you're just... Maybe your spiritual life's been in the desert, and you know why. You know why you're in a dry place, and, a, and you know why you're in a dark place, and it's time to repent and turn from that and follow God. Man, don't let today go by without doing that. If you're able, let's stand together. As we stand, if there are some of you, if some of you need to kneel this morning, if someone needs to, needs to come forward and kneel, come and kneel. If someone needs to get on your face before God, get on your face before God. But let's pray. Father God, I, Lord, you're a good God. You're over all things. And Lord, I picture those people there. Many of them have been wavering between between Baal and between the living God, and they saw your power fell from heaven, and they could do nothing but fall down in the presence of your power. Father, Father, we need you. Father, I pray that you would awaken in our hearts and our minds and in this church um, the truth that at the core of what we believe is that you change hearts and lives, that you take what we don't understand and you are able to move and you do big things. Father, help us to be faithful in, in seeking you. Help us to be faithful in allowing you to do a work in our heart. And Lord, if there's someone who needs, to, who needs to repent, who needs to let go, who needs to begin to do the process of, of letting go of something that is not of you, Lord, I just pray that today, even now, they would say, Lord, this is yours. Lord, it's not mine. I'm surrendering it to you. I'm trusting you to help me. But Lord, remind us all that we are not called to live out our faith alone. Remind us all that we need to partner with someone to walk with us. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we will give you the glory this day in Jesus' name. Amen. God is good.